Coming up, why a feud over Lyft now has Kansas City duking it out in federal court. Michelle Obama in Topeka marking 60 years of Brown versus the Board of Education. Six decades on, how far have Kansas City schools come? Missouri passes the longest abortion wait times in the nation, while Kansas adopts new rules that have university professors outraged. Plus, the UMKC Conservatory inching closer to moving downtown. Those stories and more coming up on a particularly action-packed edition of Kansas City Week in Review. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Haynes, researching, analyzing, and dissecting the week's news. The Kansas City Star's nationally syndicated columnist, Mary Sanchez, from the pitch reporter, Steve Vokrot, star political reporter, blogger, and columnist, Dave Helling, and from the star editorial board, Barbara Shelley. We start this week with an uplifting story, or is it a downlifting story? At any rate, Kansas City's with Lyft heads to federal court. City officials are trying to put the brakes on the new ride-sharing service. They claim Lyft and its pink-mustached vehicles are operating illegally in the city, its drivers bypassing the normal screening and certification process. Nor have they paid, they say, the required licensing taxes for their business activities. Now, a second ride-sharing company has set up shop, San Francisco-based Uber. These companies operate, though, in dozens of other cities coast-to-coast. Why is it a problem here, first of all? Barbara? Well, it's a problem in other cities, too. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Lyft is in litigation in St. Louis and all over the country, really. And I think they just adopt that as part of their business model, is that they're going to come and um, get in trouble and that people are going to like them or at least like the concept of them and it'll work out. Chances are good that the vast majority of our audience, Steve Ockrod, including myself, have absolutely no clue how these services work. Can you just give us a quick um, elevator speech on how they work? Sure. So Lyft, you have an app on your phone, your smartphone, and if you want to ride somewhere, you open the app, and a driver driving there who uses the vehicle as their primary personal vehicle will come pick you up, take you to where you want to go, and the fee structure is that there is no real fee. There's a suggested it's donation. Free. Yeah, well, I, don't, I haven't tried it, and okay. I don't imagine that I would, but it's sort of like when you go into a museum, there's a suggested donation box. You can go in and bypass it, or you can put $5 in. Well, with Lyft, there's a suggested donation, but there's not a fixed fee, and that's part of what they contend uh, makes them different than a taxi or livery service, and therefore the ordinances do not apply to them. So why is the city so bent out of shape, though, about this, and including the taxi service, which feels it's really at a disadvantage okay, by this just, service, Mary? Well, which is interesting, though, because Bill George actually says that um, he has a similar app program. I think he probably is still charging and isn't doing this donation sort of how do you want to manage your fare um, thing. I kind of wonder if it actually would go over well here in Kansas City. I mean, we're such a car driving society. I kind of wonder about that. But City Hall is really interested too. And also just the issues of regulation. You know, are they properly licensed? This sort of thing. And to me, it's almost like a soup kitchen. You know, just because I want to run a soup kitchen and say, well, I'm going to give the food away, doesn't mean that there aren't still health concerns that the city really needs to look after. And that's their concern. And that, that part of it is very valid, I think. You, you said we are a such a car-centric society. We also want to be this entrepreneurial city, Dave Helling. Mm -hmm. Why is the city going after these two companies when we want to also be seen to be uh, such an attractive place for new companies, yeah. particularly companies like this one, these startup companies that attract younger types of folks to the metropolitan right. area? Well, be, because there is always an inherent tension in any community, and Kansas City is no different, between politicians and policymakers who want to regulate public services, not just cabs, but restaurants, other types of transportation. It ha you know, the, the health uh, department inspects a lot of different things in Kansas City to, to try and make sure that they meet some minimum standard of, of public safety. And there's always a tension between that and companies that invent workarounds, you know, new ways of doing things. H here's a good way to understand it. The, the, the Kansas City Star would just as soon all bloggers go away because we'd like to have the news business to ourselves. And it would be great if the city would start imposing regulations on bloggers that they have the same restrictions that we have. But we don't do that because the First Amendment allows people to speak their mind in whatever vehicle they can. 
And that's a similar tension that you see between established companies like cab companies and these upstart entrepreneurial companies, not only here, as I suggest, but around the country as well. So what is going to happen here, though? Are these companies going to say this is too much bother, Steve, and they're going to leave? Well, so far, no. And so what's happened is that the city tried to get a restraining order, a temporary restraining order, while they sort these issues out against Lyft to prevent them from doing business. Right before there was a court hearing to determine that in a state-level court in Jackson County, the attorneys for Lyft got the case kicked up into federal court where the wheels tend to move a bit slower. So, you know, that buys them some time. And, you know, part of why, part of the reason why city officials are upset about it is Lyft really more or less just came in and started without giving much of a heads up that I can tell. I was on a phone with a Lyft representative yesterday and pressed her about what communications did you guys have with the city beforehand? And the answer was pretty wishy-washy. And you know, Uber, which is the other, which is the other company entering the market, very similar to Lyft. My understanding is they had been trying to work with the city for several weeks, and then once Lyft really got going, Uber said, "Well, we got to get going too." Uh, so it's gonna, it's probably gonna play out in the courts here for a while. Barbara. I don't think these companies are really into rule following, and I think they're very comfortable being renegade. And I also think there will be a market for services like this. I think students at UMKC who don't have a car, if you want to go uptown to the Power and Light District, you just call Lyft and, you know, and negotiate a fee to the airport. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's expensive going to the airport. I, I, I do see a market for it. Particularly yeah. when you can just give a, uh, a suggested fee for the service. Right, exactly. As we tape yeah. this program Friday morning, First Lady Michelle Obama is scheduled to be in our area. She's marking 60 years of the landmark Brown versus Board of Education Topeka, Kansas school desegregation ruling. She was originally scheduled to deliver a graduation speech for high school seniors in Topeka, but that plan was scrapped after nearly 2,000 people signed a petition in protest. Instead, she will deliver remarks of what is being billed as a senior recognition event. Mary, can you refresh our memories as to why 1,750 people would protest having one of the best-known people in America speaking at their child's graduation? Well, it depends on who you ask. Okay. I mean, one part of the argument was people claimed that it was a racial backlash, that they didn't want the African-American first lady coming. I think that was ridiculous. I mean, you're always going to find those voices, believe me, listen to my voicemail or read my emails. They're out there. The haters are there. However, in this case, I think really what most people wanted is that if, had she come for the actual graduation, they were going to restrict, partly because of security concerns, the numbers of people that could come to support each graduate. And you just, that really just doesn't play well with families. Um, so they couldn't have as many family members as they wanted to come? couldn't have as many. Say, like myself, I mean, I attended all my nieces and nephews' graduations. There's no way you could have kept me away. Um, and I think that sort of maybe extraneous family, nuclear, broader relationships were what was getting nipped here. Um, and I think very graciously the White House said, okay, we understand, let's rearrange it so she's here today. So it wasn't a situation where they said, okay, we got all these people protesting, Barbara, I'm not coming now. Oh, no, no, they work, work out an accommodation, but you know. Um, they're going to allow everybody, to, every graduate, to have six guests, yeah. which to me seems like a, 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 an adequate amount. So, yeah, I think yeah. part of the problem was that for a lot of people, high school graduation is an extraordinarily important mm -hmm. uh, rite of passage, particularly for students who don't plan to go to college. And even college graduations are a little less in a lot of ways than high school graduations. And so you did get the sense that some parents were worried that the speech would somehow detract from the more sort of intimate nature, family nature of, of what is a pretty big moment for a lot of people. So Mary's right, the White House sort of probably got that a little bit and said, look, let's ratchet back a little bit, keep every Everybody happy, uh, and it seems to be going off in that sense without a hitch. And talking about big moments, uh, even a British high schooler or a comprehensive school student, as we called them back in Britain, knew all about the Brown versus Board of Education case. And now it's 60 years that we're marking, which will be Sunday, 60 years of that case. 60 years on, how are we doing with regards to what is supposed to be the desegregation of schools in America when it comes to schools in our own backyard, Mary Sanchez? Well, they're still very racially and class-based segregated. Um, if anything, to me, class is the overarching issue. You can certainly paint it in racial tones as well. But it's a class issue. Uh, race in America is class anymore. Um, you know, again, like I previously said, you're always going to have the racist elements out there. 
where we're talking about class distinctions and horrible problems. I mean, that gets into some of our other topics for today with the Kansas City School District and its unaccredited status. And how do you manage that? Uh, we're not, we are 60 years in, we have not solved some of the most baseline problems. I mean, what Board and Brown was about was the inherent inequities of educational, public education in America, and that is still a problem in America. You're talking about those other issues then. I mean, speaking of schools, a bill aimed at fixing Missouri's school transfer law is heading to the governor's desk this week. But whether Governor Jay Nixon will sign it remains a question. Nixon opposes a provision that allows students in unaccredited schools, which includes the Kansas City, Missouri School District, to use public money to transfer to a private, non-religious school. So is it possible nothing will happen now, even though, Barbara Shelley, this was supposed to be the most important issue of the session when it started back in January? It was said to be at least one of the most important issues of the session. And I will say about the bill that was just passed, um, it does open the door to public money going to private schools but only a really little crack. The only reason to veto this bill is if you really believe in the slippery slope argument. This bill calls for, um, in, before um, students could use state money to go to a, a non-religious private school, we'd have to have a vote here in Kansas City to get that done. That to me seems very dubious that, it, you know, that a proposal like that could pass a vote. Um, and then the private schools would have to agree to meet um, state requirements. And I'm, I'm very skeptical that private schools would want to do that, meet those state requirements. So it, it's a, edging a little bit into school choice, voucher territory, but not a whole lot to me. And, and even some of the African-American lawmakers in Jeff City are urging the governor to sign this bill. Democrats. The, the Democrats, because in essence they've said it's been such a, you know, the negotiation of all the interests is so difficult that to veto it now would really uh, uh, set back the cause of trying to get a, find a way out of this mess. Uh, but it also reflects, Nick, I think the difficulty in getting to this point in Kansas City is reflective of the broader question you asked about Brown versus Board, and that is that the court really 60 years ago had the easy job when it said you can't segregate your schools by law anymore. The much harder part is integrating schools. How do you get rid of de facto segregation, if you will? And no one has really been able to figure that out. That isn't just a problem in Kansas City. It, it's a problem in virtually every urban area in America. And uh, it, it, you, know, you don't see any signposts that maybe will solve that anytime soon either. Kansas City engineering giant Burns and McDonald got the green light this week from the Kansas City Council on more than $40 million in city tax incentives to expand its headquarters on the site of the former Beth Shalom Synagogue at 94th and Warnell Road. Now, we talked about this project at length two weeks ago. What does the city really get, though, in return for that $40 million investment? Well, the city's going to, you know, certainly the politicians are going to be able to say, you know, we helped bring you know, 2,100 jobs to an area. Uh, they're going to they're gonna claim that these new employees are going to get gas, you know, buy gas. They're going to do some shopping, get some sundries over on the Kansas City, Missouri side, which is, which is true. But they are also giving away, as you said, $40 million in mostly earnings taxes because all the new employees are going to be able to send half their earnings taxes back to the company itself. And... So that's that's one part of it, and then there's also a tax abatement too, and you know I don't want to get into all all of how that works, but there will be some taxing entities such as the Midcontinent Library that will lose money as a result of this uh, as a result of this arrangement. Dave, yeah, and uh, I think there's been some criticism of the of the proposal on those terms and on others, uh, but the reality is, uh, or at least the complicated picture, Nick is that Kansas City has walked down this path many, many, many times before. And, and it, it, you know, it would have been probably uh, at least defensible if, if the city council members had said, you know, we will go no further, this is it, we're not going to do this thing. But it, it, if you put yourself in those shoes, it's difficult to say no to Burns and Mack when you have said yes so many times before, particularly given Burns and Mack's position in the communities. It's a difficult vote. It's easy to judge, di more difficult to cast that ballot. Barbara. Well, they're a great corporate citizen, and these are 
good jobs. These are jobs with an average salary of 120000 I mean, it's pretty hard for the city council to say no to 2,000 jobs at that level and, and what that could mean for a community. Yeah. Well, but speaking of taxes, how high might your local sales tax go? In just 48 hours this week, the Kansas City, Missouri Council approves putting on the August ballot a quarter cent sales tax for the Kansas City Fire Department. Missouri lawmakers green lined a three quarter cent sales tax hike for highways that you'll be asked to vote on this November. And a judge approves the expanded streetcar transportation district that will likely have you voting on a one cent sales tax hike for streetcars this fall. All this in two days, Dave Helling? Yes, let's be clear quickly. The, the sales tax vote for highways in Missouri may or may not be on in November. It could go on in August. The governor will make that decision, and I don't think he's made that yet. I could be wrong. My colleagues will correct me if I am. But nevertheless, this year, we'll be facing in Kansas City alone a potential increase, at least most of Kansas City, on the streetcar. Two cent increase in sales tax. That is an astonishing fact. Uh, and, and you do wonder whether anyone ever got into a room and said, wait, do we want to put all of these things on the ballot all at the same time or in the same year? Because, the, you know, I did a little back of the envelope calculation this morning. The 10-year cost of just those three taxes is easily a billion dollars out of the pockets of Kansas Cityans to pay for projects. Let's face it, Nick, you may never ride the streetcar. It's possible you'll never cross a bridge that gets fixed. Uh, you know, you may never need the fire department. That's a little. Oh, we should say that's also so, a renewal. It's a renewal. Yes, but 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 yeah. I guess my point is that regressive sales taxes are the tax of choice, and we may see this year whether that appetite is ended. Steve, you've also been voters. looking at how this actually affects consumers. Right, and so in some in some areas of town, the sales tax rate when you add up the county, the state, and the city base rate, it's eight point three five. And in other areas, like downtown in the South Loop, it's 10.35. And so if all these things pass, in some areas of town, you're going to be exceeding 12% sales tax. I talked to a real estate developer who does a lot of retail, uh, retail work a few years ago, and I asked him, you know, at what point do consumers really start to pay attention to sales tax rates? And he said, my research indicates that they don't until it reaches 10%. Wow. And then they start to pay attention. Well, in Kansas City, Missouri, Downtown and other places, it's going to be getting up to about 12%, and that should be a concern for city leaders. But given that there's three measures just this year alone, I don't know. We've got a lot of other things to discuss on this week in review. Missouri lawmakers this week approving the longest abortion waiting period in the nation three days, 72 hours, tripling the current 24 hour waiting period with no exemptions for rape or incest. Democrats filibustered the bill but backed off as part of a grand bargain with Republicans. Is this how it works, Mary? Well, apparently, because that's how they got it through. Um, I don't think that uh, Nixon will sign it. But to me, this, I mean, and I am all for reducing the number of abortions. I mean, I think anyone would be. But I just really question that they think this is, that that is actually going to make this occur. If You know, it, it's almost just... It doesn't make sense. It's as if they're just assuming that if you make a woman wait long enough, it's not going to happen. As if women just on a whim go off and get an abortion like it's something not a quick well, trip. What surprised me then, uh, Mary, is in looking at some of the news accounts here, there's only actually one place in the whole state yeah. of Missouri that actually performs abortions, and that is in St. Louis. Louis. St. Louis, yeah. So it's not like there are loads of places you can even have but a you termination can procedure. go ahead. And that, I mean, it does. It gets into that... One caveat of talking about abortions making it, you know, it is still legal. Whether Republican lawmakers like this or not, abortion is legal in America. But how do you make it rare and keep it safe? And I worry that they are pushing down the line to make it less safe. But Democrats, again, ended their filibuster, mm -hmm. struck a grand bargain with Republicans mm -hmm. to make this happen, though. Yeah, and I think the big thing they gained was the Republicans setting aside talk of a voter ID law for another year. And frankly, I'm just stunned that Missouri doesn't have a voter ID law that has been held off yeah. year after year. That, so that, that was the big thing. The, the other trade yeah. was uh, the Republicans agreed to back off paycheck protection, which is a labor-related, mm -hmm. union-related, almost sort of light right to work, if you will. 
But as a political matter, Nick, uh, you know, I wrote a column a couple of weeks ago about how they don't trade anymore, and then of course they com proved me a complete idiot <laughs> by Absolutely. trading like crazy. <laughs> yes. So, but. You did. Um, but it is fascinating to me that, in essence, Republicans thought abortion limitations were so significant that they were willing to give up things like voter ID and paycheck protection, which are yes. huge items on most agendas. And at the same time, it's interesting to me that Democrats would trade that away. Uh, you know, it, it, you know it, let's not let them off the hook. They sort of said, okay, we believe in a woman's right to abortion, but we'll trade that to protect unions and voter ID. Uh, I, I'm not sure anybody comes out of that. That agreement looking looking great to me as well, a political matter you know the abortion bill did not pass the Senate by a veto proof majority so is there, so it's that although it's just a one vote margin mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that was in play there was early voting and that's something the Republicans gained was that they're going to have a very weak watered down early voting proposal on the ballot probably at the same time as a very substantial citizens initiative University professors in Kansas are still unhappy as a revised social media policy is adopted by the board that oversees higher education in the state. The policy permits top administrators to discipline, suspend, or fire professors who use social media improperly. It was adopted after a KU journalism professor's tweet last fall that blasted the National Rifle Association following the Washington Navy Yard shootings that killed a dozen people. In that tweet, Professor David Guth said the blood is on the hands of the NRA. Next time let it be your sons and daughters. Shame on you. May God damn you. This is supposed to be a new revised social media policy that balances academic freedom. So why are professors still packing the Board of Regents meeting with red buttons saying free speech and decrying this as punitive, Barbara? Because of the part of the Regents policy that says professors could face disciplinary actions straight up to being fired if something they post on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and all the rest, is deemed to be contrary to the interest of their employer. Uh, that's very subjective. It's very vague. It was done with no input with, from the faculty, and that's why they're still upset. Now, it was interesting, though, Mary, I was looking at some of the comments that come from all of these articles that appeared, and this has got a lot of national attention as well, This whole and academics are outraged even on a national level. This is one re remark from Earl. It appears that Professor Guth used his own personal Twitter account. I'm having trouble relating that to the university. Am I missing something? And then Christie responds, nothing is private anymore. Ask Donald Sterling. I mean, is that the bottom line here, that really nothing is private uh, at any point anymore. Well, that's the part of reality that needed to be a part of this whole discussion. To me, it was an overreaction. It wasn't like we had KU professors going rogue and wild and using even their personal accounts to tweet out obnoxious things, which it was an obnoxious post. It was ridiculous. But to overreach and go this far and craft a whole new, um, you know, way of regulation, I mean, it's, it's just, if you could regulate common decency and common sense, that'd be great, but you can't. But we didn't have a major problem to begin with, so why are we even having this? But I think one of the problems is that Kansas University and all universities, uh, or, or most universities, are public institutions, mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe the standard is different, Nick, to a degree. For example, the, the newspaper believes in the First Amendment, we live by the First Amendment, but we were all asked to recently sign uh, a, a, an agreement in which the social media policy was described, and they're very clear to, to sort of suggest to you, as they are in most businesses, that if you tweet or post something that is injurious to the employer, you could get in trouble for that. That, I don't think, is necessarily a First Amendment offense. It's what businesses do, and uh, we may not like it, but, but it's what they do. But professors are used to having a, a, big, yes. a different type of standard, though, yes. aren't they? Yes, and, although not that different from That's journalists right. okay. who believe in the First Amendment. So it's a little more complicated maybe than just you know, yes or no All right. to me. And finally, what is being hailed as a critical boost towards moving the UMKC Conservatory of Music and Dance to downtown Kansas City? Supporters have acquired an entire city block immediately south of the Kaufman Center. With the land now purchased, is the dream of bringing UMKC's performing arts programs downtown finally becoming a reality, Steve? Well, not quite. It's a, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, their fundraising is going fairly well, depending on how you look at it. They still have a ways to go. 
And once they get to it's about $48 million fundraising goal, what they're counting on is to have the state of Missouri match that. And that's a big question mark. And I, I'm not so certain that, the, that Missouri will come through. They say they will. They have said it in the past, but when it comes up, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of money for the legislature to part with. They may, they may throw a wrench in this. Barbara? Uh, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. You, you don't think they would, the state would have the money to do that? <sighs> Who knows? It just depends on the year and what their priorities are and whether they're mad at Kansas City for <laughs> something else. That this year has become such a critical what? issue now. It's one of the big five yeah. items for the Chamber of Commerce. Aren't they going to make sure that this actually happens? Well, you would hope. Let's make sure that a, a ballet dancer doesn't tweet something out that annoys somebody. Um, I think it needs to happen. I mean, and, it, and it's happening the right way with Kauffman Center and so many things. It's a synergy that's starting to occur. But it is good that it's it's taken it some time to build. And, uh, and, we, and we just we just saw a story in the Kansas City Star this week that Jane Shu, who was the yes. head of the right. uh, the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts, uh, also her nomination for the National Endowment for the Arts moving forward very swiftly. That is going smoothly. She could find the money from the NEA to make that project well, happen. Well, I'm not right. sure capital costs. <laughs> okay. 20 years ago, the yeah. Missouri legislature would have invented a tax credit, and that would have made everyone happy. A <laughs> right. little tougher now. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the Kansas City Star, Dave Helling and Mary Sanchez, from the Star Editorial Board, Barbara Shelley, and from The Pitch, Steve Volkrot. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.